I'm Milan Verveer. I am the director of the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security at Georgetown University, and I'm formerly the first uh, U.S. ambassador for global women's issues. As the first ambassador for global women's issues, Ambassador Vervier, you helped to advance Secretary Hillary Clinton's agenda that women's human rights should be a critical cornerstone of foreign policy. And as part of that agenda and vision, you were the chief architect of the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. You also um, were very much the influencer in making sure that the United States quadrennial diplomatic and development report not only <coughs> embraces gender sensitive language, but also mainstreams women's human rights in all of its provisions. Um, you've also been one of the foremost advocates here at the US as well as around the world in bringing more women to the peace building and peacemaking table. Despite all of those efforts, the numbers, as you know, are dire. We have just over 2% women who are signatories to peace treaties, approximately 9% women who are mediators and negotiators of peace, and we are yet to have a chief mediator or negotiator of peace being a woman. Despite these uh, abysmal numbers, we know both anecdotally and through the uh, evidence-based research that women at the table make a difference in both shaping the peace treaty and making sure that women's issues are central to peace building and in sustaining the peace. The evidence now is clear that when women are at the table, there is a 20% higher chance that the peace endures for longer than a two-year period of time. What I want to know from you, given your rich experience working with numbers of women and women's movements around the world in almost every conflict and post-conflict situation, I want you to share with us some of the stories of how difference made a difference, how women at the table did make an impact and beyond. Well, thank you, Rangita, and let me tell you, it's such a pleasure to be here at Penn Law uh, and to be able to engage in this discussion with you and uh, with our viewers. Um, you had mentioned several things that I've been involved in, uh, both in helping to uh, launch the United States National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, uh, as well as what we call the QDDR, the review uh, that was initiated to take place every four years looking at the role of the State Department's diplomatic mission and how it's executed as well as its development mission. And I think one of the fundamental pieces uh, in both of those uh, areas is the fact that we need to recognize that these issues of a gender lens, a women's perspective if you will and participation, uh, need to be integrated throughout the work of our diplomatic missions, or in the case of development, development missions. Uh, that it's not enough to have a project here and a project there. The, the great power of government is in all of its uh, components. Uh, in the State Department, for example, we look at everything and engage in regional bureaus and economic affairs uh, in conflict and stability. And the whole hope uh, and necessity, it shouldn't be an option, uh, is that we will be that much better at what our mission is and executing that mission uh, if we uh, have this gender lens. And certainly in the area of women, peace, and security, uh, that's critically important. Uh, the United Nations, uh, some 15 years ago, adopted a Security Council resolution uh, linking women's uh, participation to peace and security. Uh, also, over the last uh, 15 years since, added to that in significant ways to enhance uh, its importance and put uh, stronger uh, measures out for states to be engaged in. Um, and yet, as you said, the record is not what it should be, uh, because all too often, uh, within the first five years, the agreements that are adopted are abrogated. 
uh, women are very minorly uh, represented uh, in peace processes. Uh, but where they have been, uh, we have much to learn. And in fact, the work that I'm engaged in uh, at Georgetown is to create that evidence-based case of women's, uh, the linkage between women's engagement and the difference it makes uh, in terms of uh, lasting peace, sustainable peace, uh, the kind of actions that need to take place and be influenced to take place going forward. Northern Ireland, for example, is a, uh, a one of those great examples of um, the engagement of women in that case, they wanted uh, to get everyone to the table, even the most radical elements, because the understanding was if everybody was at the table, you would then address the issues. Well, there was never any mm -hmm. intention to get women to the table. It was the radical elements that were involved in the, in the trouble, so to speak. Uh, but in the process, women managed to get the numbers that they needed uh, to get the, to the table, and in the process, created the Women's Political Party, uh, the Women's Coalition. Uh, and what we know from that experience, and it still goes on because peace negotiations are part of an iterative process. It has to go forward over time. It has many pieces that have to be addressed. There are hiccups in the process, but you need, you need to keep at it. Uh, peace doesn't happen overnight. And in Northern Ireland, we know from the effort the women made uh, critical issues like human rights, um, uh, schooling, integrated schooling, which in a society where Catholics were here and Protestants were here and they never had any interaction, the value of integrated education uh, is an obvious value. Uh, a civic forum, uh, issues uh, having to do with economics and livelihood, because how do you go forward after an agreement? These are the kinds of things that women added uh, to the negotiations uh, in the Northern Irish peace process. Uh, and to this day, uh, efforts have to continue to be made at addressing them so that this peace uh, that in 1998 uh, was adopted, uh, the Good Friday Accords, uh, can continue to make a difference for people there. Uh, we most recently saw the first ever a uh, woman assigned by her government in the Philippines uh, to negotiate on the part of the government uh, the uh, mm -hmm. negotiations over the Mindanao rebels. It, uh, it, another conflict that has gone on for a long, long time, uh, and this was an effort to jumpstart that. And when that process started, it was tremendously inclusive, uh, and the hope of both the government and the participants uh, was that a uh, a framework would be adopted with all of the critical components that would in the end begin to address uh, what had been a simmering, difficult, uh, often deadly uh, in instances, uh, conflict that needed to be remedied. Um, we just did a study on women leading peace where we looked at a place like Northern Ireland uh, where you had women at the table of the Philippines where you had them leading the negotiations on one side. Uh, and other instances, Kenya for example, where the role of a mediator made a difference. A female mediator in this case, Grasha yes. Michelle, yes. Who, who went out of her way to bring women into the process uh, and in that way got their uh, perspectives on the table to have some impact. In Guatemala for example, uh, after that civil war that, that we have seen vestiges of to this day, uh, because it's not been wholly addressed still, um, the women became part of the overall civil society. Uh, they didn't play that kind of specific role. Uh, but what's very interesting is that it empowered them as part of civil society. Uh, you saw over time in the last uh, recent history, a female attorney general, um, other women on the constitutional courts, 24-hour uh, domestic courts to address violence against women. You began to see in Guatemala in recent years, as one woman said to me, I never thought there could be justice in my country, and now I believe there can be. And what the attorney general, Claudia Pazipaz, with the support, obviously, of others 
uh, in her government was able to do is bring the first case in all of the years that had elapsed uh, to bring the military dictator who had perpetrated uh, the, the, the crimes and, and uh, moved forward in this horrible conflict uh, to uh, a trial. Uh, and that process continues. But what we saw in the process is the indigenous people who had been tremendously impacted in the most horrific ways for the first time were able to give their testimony. And the value of their testimony alone has, has enabled large numbers of average citizens to understand that they have a role to play as citizens with respect to their government. Uh, and not too long ago, we're here in uh, tw early 2016, not too long ago, uh, you had the people coming together in large, large numbers uh, in massive demonstrations to remove a corrupt uh, head of state uh, in a way that probably would never have happened had this process of empowerment not gone forward. So in those four places alone, you see that kind of difference that access to the table despite what those women went through, uh, but what role they were able to play that uh, is manifested to this day in a piece that is held uh, to what has been uh, begun in the Philippines last year and uh, now needs to be addressed by the parliament so that agreement can be ratified uh, and resources and other uh, means going forward. And then the role of a mediator, increased emphasis on female mediators, uh, there are too few, um, and uh, just what it takes to empower a citizenry, even if they don't have that direct role, but their beginnings in a process, hardly adequate, but even playing a positive role. Uh, so we have much to learn, and one of the reasons we're involved in this space um, is because, look at Liberia. The women in Liberia were absolutely instrumental uh, with finally getting peace, uh, peace agreement in Liberia. Had it not been for the documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, we probably wouldn't know a whole lot about what happened in Liberia to this day, because in these conflicts, you're talking about tremendously difficult situations, uh, poor people largely, uh, the stories that don't get written, and we've got to learn from their oral histories, uh, from research, from data collection, uh, from everything we can get together uh, to tell us how it can inform the, 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 the current conflicts. Women are affected by conflict differently. Uh, and this has to be factored in. Okay. Milan, some of the case studies that you shared with us um, from Mindanao peace process, the Kenyan peace process, the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, uh, what those peace processes showcased, although they were inflection points in their peace uh, building efforts and had a profound impact on peacekeeping, was the tenacious struggle of women to get to the peace making table. And as Grasa Marcel said in Kenya, when women are shut out from the door, women are left to shout through the windows. And I think that was very evocative of what really happened in all of those case studies that the women who finally struggled to get to the table were women from civil society, women who were part of a larger women's movement. These were not women who were appointed by their governments. These were women who had fought for women's rights and were part of a very endogenous, organic women's movement in their communities. And that is why when they were present at the table, the peace was able to endure longer than other more conventional types of uh, peace processes. And that brings me to the question of what the global study celebrating and marking the Security Council Resolution 1325 also grapples with, are we talking of symbolic representation of women at the table, the numbers of women at the table, or substantive representation. Who are these women at the table? Do they represent the voices of the women of the civil society? 
and you know I would like to say both we need the critical mass of women and we need the greater representation of women uh, who are from the different diverse groups whether they are ethnic uh, racial religious um, ability based diversity groups we need all of these voices helping to shape make build and then keep the peace so with that in mind, I want you to spend a little more time talking about the ways in which these women struggled. What were the tactics that they used? Because sometimes they were in Timor-Leste, they created their own, um, what I would say, alternative peace process when they were shut out from the formal peace processes. And sometimes those alternative peace processes really captured the voice of the community when some of these other more formal processes did not. So I wanted to focus on those stories and the struggles uh, and the struggle that continues to bring women to the table. Well, you know, that's so well said, Rangita, because it is true uh, that these um, participations don't just come out of uh, uh, someone's saying, well, let me put you at the table. Um, in fact, the peace process actually begins in the villages, in the communities, in the cities, where there is a struggle long before there's any formality uh, that is put together to recognize that there are injustices occurring, there is a desperate need to remedy the, the situation that is um, uh, significantly negatively impacting the people and it is that effort that understanding of what needs to be done uh, that women as you well stated the resilience the strength the courage to say enough already and most much of this comes out of enough already uh, in Northern Ireland for example I remember uh, back at 1995 I was accompanying uh, the first lady at the time Hillary Clinton and we went uh, to a very pedestrian uh, restaurant called Ye Olde Lamplighter. It was in a rundown neighborhood that had suffered the troubles on both sides. And these were simple women. Um, and they weren't highfalutin, they weren't uh, with connection, they weren't highly educated, but they knew the situation in their community had to change. They were losing their husbands, they were losing fathers, they were losing sons. Uh, and it was on the basis of things that they could do immediately that they came together. Living separately, living in ways that never brought them together, they began to come together. For example, over the price of the children's milk for school. They, neither side could afford to have the price of milk go, go up. Uh, they banded together, their voices were heard, and in the process of beginning to come together on issues that affected the whole community, they were seeing the power of their own strength in many ways. Um, and over time, in, in Northern Ireland, they were able to create a social infrastructure that exists to this day, where divisions were crossed, uh, and the hard work of bringing change to a community, it doesn't come magically from a future peace agreement. It has to happen every day in people's lives. Indeed, what's whispered into the ears of the children as they're tucked into bed. Uh, this is how we together have to move forward. In Liberia, it was the simple market women. They, they could not take what was going on anymore. The massive death, the criminality, uh, the need for, for the dictator Taylor uh, to begin seriously to bring an end to the violence. Uh, they went, uh, and the, the powerful words of Lema Gabawi, who came out of that society, and they went and they said, they spoke truth to power, the simple truth of average people, market women, who went to uh, the, the, the dictator. Uh, and when the men finally became engaged in the peace process, nothing much was happening. And it was happening in an adjacent country. And they got themselves through the most difficult conditions to those peace talks. They were outside the window. They were outside the door. They were sitting mm -hmm. together, 
refusing to let the men come out until they actually got serious about reaching an agreement and getting the work done. So it isn't just at the table. That is critically important mm -hmm. because that's where ultimately uh, the significant decisions will get made in terms of the cessation of hostilities and then how do you go forward for reconciliation to address the big issues that caused the conflict in the first place and need to be addressed. Uh, but without that, that preparatory process, if you will, of people in their everyday lives, significantly women, trying to address uh, what has uh, overtaken their societies. Um, so uh, this is a, a very important part of the process, not to negate the role of civil society, uh, because uh, it has a huge impact. Today, uh, as we are hoping that with the temporary cessation, and may it not be just temporary, of s some of the hostilities, not all, in Syria, there has been an effort by the United Nations envoy, mm -hmm. Stefan Di Mastura, mm -hmm. who was previously the envoy to Afghanistan. Uh, he was sensitive to the important role that women have to play uh, in Afghanistan. And now in Syria, although this is a very, very complex, uh, horrific situation that's gone on for a long time, he is attempting uh, to bring people together around a process that hopefully will influence ultimately what occurs to bring an end uh, to the struggle in, in Syria. Now what he has done, and this is very, very uh, interesting and goes along with what you said, is not only worked uh, in the creation of the opposition uh, and, and helping to negotiate who should be part of that opposition group that will be in the uh, the first rung of these talks, uh, and there are women as well as men. But in addition to that, he has created a group of civil society participants, a women's group, um, to advise him. Uh, they are in the same arena as these track one players, if you will. They are talking to each other. They have an influence, uh, and that combination of appreciating the role that they have to play and the role that others and women have to be pre uh, represented in that role comes together in a way that hopefully will ultimately impact the outcome. I want to thank you for coming to Penn Law, um, for letting us celebrate and honor you as a summit awardee, as a trailblazer who has um, who has shared the light with many travelers who have struggled for women's rights around the world. The light that you have shone on the women around the world has really come back to light the lives of women in the US and around the world. I want to thank you once again for being one of our summit awardees, but most of all, I want to thank you for everything that you have done globally for women's human rights and for pushing this agenda. Well, thank you, Rangita, for your own role in all of this space, uh, but also to tell you it has been an enormous pleasure for me to be here at Penn, uh, to be engaged in so many exciting discussions, uh, and I look forward to coming back. Thank you.